Let's get underway. Sorry for the delay. Um, good afternoon to those joining us from Asia and the Middle East, and good morning to those dialing in from Europe. I'm Michael Lawrence. Welcome to today's event, China's Gen Z, Shaping the Future of the Workplace, which AJ House is producing in partnership with the Hong Kong Graduate School of Business. Today marks the launch of a new report by the Research Center of Leadership, Behavioral Science and Inclusivity of CKGSB. The report is titled Understanding China's Gen Z in the Workplace, and it will form the basis of today's discussion. It's a comprehensive piece of research which, ex which examines the unique values, preferences, and work styles of China's Generation Z, and how organizations must develop management practices tailored to a Gen Z workforce. The rise of Gen Z is having profound implications for businesses, comprising 15% of China's total population, this new generation has entered the workplace having grown up during a period of rapid technological change and for the most part, accelerated economic development, punctuated by the global pandemic and its dramatic impact on economic growth, business and society. Like all other generations, Gen Z have their own unique values, preferences and work styles and forward-thinking organizations are evolving their talent strategies to adapt to this crop of new talent. The findings of the report are based on a survey of almost 17,000 individuals across China covering all age groups. The survey defines Gen Z as young people aged between 18 and 25 years old, therefore born between 1996 and 2003, who had been working for less than three years at the time they took part in the study. The report offers a comprehensive analysis of Gen Z and covers everything from their value preferences, career choices, and psychological status, alignment between personal interests and jobs, resilience, and intergenerational differences. One striking finding of the research is that Gen Z is the least satisfied generation in the workplace across various markers, including salary, working environment, career development, fulfillment, stability, and work-life balance. So there are some clear challenges for employers. In a few moments, CKGSB will present the main findings of the report, after which we will have a discussion with three recruitment experts to look at how organizations are shaping their strategies for the Gen Z workforce. Today's discussion will be in English and we are providing translation in Mandarin. So if you'd like to hear the translation, you go to Zoom and you click the Mandarin button. Obviously, if you want the original English language, check the English button. And today's discussion, to be clear, is on the record. We are recording the event and we'll make it widely available to everyone afterwards. So to get us underway with today's keynote address, it is my pleasure to welcome Tanuj Kapilashrami, Group Head of Human Resources at Standard Chartered Bank. Oops, sorry, we seem to have a problem here with Tanuj. He'll be with us very shortly. So I'll tell you what we do. We'll go straight to the report and have a briefing on the main findings of this very comprehensive piece of research. It's my pleasure to welcome now from Beijing, Dr. Zhang Xiaomeng, who is Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior, Associate Dean for Inclusivity, Diversity and Equity, Academic Director for Executive Education, and Director of the Research Center for Leadership, Behavioral Science and Inclusivity of CKGSB. Professor, over to you. Thank you, Michael. And I'm going to uh, share my screen first, okay? Uh, is this good? Yep, we've got it. We, please go on. Yeah, we have it. We can see. You can see the full screen of this, Absolutely. right? I, I'm uh, moving my mouse here. You yep, can see that, it. right? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. So uh, let me uh, start my presentation and introduce the key findings of this uh, very interesting piece of research. So uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone from different locations. Uh, this is my great honor to present my latest report, the research on understanding China's Generation Z in the workplace. 
So as we all know, uh, with the influx of Gen Z, uh, Michael just introduced the definition of Gen Z commonly known as the post-95 generation into the workplace. Many companies and managers describe them as a new mystery. But, you know, themselves and other generations actually see them differently. So I want to briefly tell you uh, the story here. All right. So in the eyes of many post 50s, 60s and 70s, Gen Z is the generation that always love to lie flat, often resign naked. So that's a very interesting word when we say resigns naked, which means that resigning before finding the next job. And sometimes they even, you know, fire their bosses. That's from the eyes of the many uh, post 50s, 60s and 70s. However, uh, in the eyes of themselves, they definitely do not agree with these labels. So they think they are um, patriotic, they are hardworking with diversified skills and uh, passions. So they describe themselves as highly potential progressive youths. So that's a very uh, different angle. Uh, in order to get a better and more intuitive understanding, so what I did, I chose two groups of my students that are most representative at CKJSB. One group are the students from our Next Generation Leading Innovators Project. They're mostly the successors of corporations that are created by their parents or family businesses. The other group, on the other hand, are the students from our CEO project, the founders and the top executives of big companies. And many of them are the parents of the students from the Next Generation Project in CKGSB. So I ask the same question, how do you view Gen Z to these two completely different groups? Well, in the Next Generation Leader Project, which is dominated by the post 90 and 95, as shown in the slide, you can see that most students believe that Generation Z is a dynamic, thoughtful, and optimistic generation. But in the CEO group dominated by the post 60s and 70s, they believe something different. They thought Gen Z is sometimes, you know, uh, egocentric. They are impulsive, and even sometimes they are uh, capricious. So it's a very different um, angle. Okay, so moving one step ahead, when I ask my CEO students who have been the top leaders of their corporations for at least 10 years, basically, what aspect of Gen Z would you like to know most about? So they answer and they told me they want to know um, the workplace values of Gen, uh, their philosophy on life, their passions, their goals, and their dreams, and how to motivate them, motivate them in the workplace, and so on and so forth. So they care about a lot of different perspectives. So in order to answer these different kind of questions, you know, facilitated by my, my platform, the research team and I conducted this a large sample of research and analysis on the workplace value of Gen Z in China. This big project was initiated in September 2021, and after multiple rounds of analysis, is finalized this year, and the English report is actually released today. So this report includes three big parts, as you can see here. Uh, number one, we target at what are Gen Z's values in the workplace? Number two, how to investigate Gen Z's attitude toward the workplace? And number three, exploring factors that influence Gen Z's resilience in the workplace. So in almost 17,000 valid research report collected, Gen Z accounts for about 21% in our database. Well, this percentage is consistent with the data given by the uh, National Bureau of Statistics. According to this numbers show on the screen, you can see that Gen Z has quickly become the main workforce in the workplace. Um, then the next questions are, what indeed are their values in the workplace? Has Gen Z really gone through the intergeneration changes? Well, let me show you some of the very interesting results from our research. 
Here we go. First of all, by comparing the views of four uh, different age groups on the overall philosophy on life, it clearly shows that there's no significant difference in the core philosophy between Gen Z and other age groups. Many values are shared, not unique. Gen Z also believes that physical and uh, psychological health is the most important thing in their life. Well, furthermore, by comparing passions and the purposes across four different age groups, we can see that Gen Z is the group with the highest proportion on gaining, enriching, and eye-opening experiences in this outlook on life. In contrast, the age group with the highest proportion of economic income increase is the one from 26 to 30 years old. So the age group of 31 to 40 is more concerned about improving their own abilities and professional achievements. Well, the group over 41 years old has the highest proportion in whether they are doing a job that they love and excel in. So they're focusing on different parts of their uh, job. And then, you know, from the perspective of factors concerned um, in career selection, the top three factors of Gen Z and post 90s generation are basically the same. That include salary, that's number one, number two, working environment, number three, development prospects. So starting from the age 31, we can see some changes here. Starting from age 31, job stability has become increasingly important. For the group age 41 and above, job stability has become the most important factor to consider. And fairness and justice in the workplace has also become one of the focuses of tension among this group. So very interesting, like, you know, as the age increase, then people's attention uh, shift from one to the others. Okay, next one. From the perspective of matching, matching what? Matching of job and their interest, and also the matching between work-life balance. The data shows here a clear trend of increasing with age. That is, the older the group, the higher the work interest matching, and the more balanced the work-life state. But here I want to especially point out, although the overall values of Gen Z are not significantly different from those of other generations, but from this comparison of short-term goals and mid-term goals, the differences of Gen Z are the most uh, obvious among old generation. So to be more specific, you can see the, uh, the picture on the uh, left up corner, the four picture here actually represent the matching degree of short-term goals and the mid-term goals of different age group. We can clearly see that matching degree of short-term goals and the relatively long-term goal of Gen Z is the lowest. So this reflects the relatively high variability of Gen Z in uh, goal setting. So, this is you know, likely to affect their cognition and working status in the workplace and definitely you know, deserve our more attention. So basically how to guide them through the early career stage in order to gain more satisfaction in the long run, the job you know, experiences. So this is a very interesting comparison across four different age group. And then from the perspective of motivation, you know, this is the, uh, the, 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 the point that manager care the most. Manager have always been very concerned about the issue of salary increases. Many people believe that Gen Z is a generation that has never experienced material scarcity, so they don't care about salary. But in fact, like other generations, Gen Z not only attaches great importance to the overall physical and mental health, but also cares about economic income. So from the perspective of the incentive effect of annual salary increase on work enthusiasm, this bar chart shows that the salary increase of, let me show the bars here, uh, the salary increase of 10% to 20% is a common expectations for all age group. So every age group, you know, hopefully they can have, you know, 10% to 20% salary increase every year. Uh, although the reality may not be the choice. 
But the group age 26 to 30 has the highest expectations for wage increases, which is consistent with the data I just mentioned earlier. This group, uh, basically aged uh, 26 to 30, is the group with the highest proportion of economic income increases. So in the meanwhile, we need to notice, you know, on this chart, uh, the very left side, uh, we need to notice that a general increase of three to 5% does not have a significant impact on work motivation at OH group. So from this point of view, it's very interesting that everybody loves money. So everybody need money, no matter their generation Z or generation X or Y. So that's very interesting. Okay. In addition, many people think that Gen Z likes to resign nakedly, as I mentioned earlier, which means you know, resigning before finding the next job. But in fact, we can see from the research result, if the job turns out unsatisfactory, just like other generations, most Gen Z would also first considering adjust their mentality and continue to work. About 20% of Gen Z will apply for internal job uh, transfer. Only 5.5% of Gen Z will choose to resign naked. And this phenomenon is actually not exclusive to Gen Z. Other generations will also choose to quit their job to do some freelance work. And there's no particular significant difference in the proportion. So this one is actually the opposite as what we usually believe uh, in the workplace. However, on the phenomenon of resignation, I want to point out our research find that compared with other generations, the cycle of salary increase and promotion expected by Gen Z is shorter. That means Gen Z hopes to get more frequent promotions and pay raises. To be more specific, this figure shows that under the premise of normal work performance, Nearly 54% of Gen Z thinks that they will consider leaving if they fail to receive a salary increase within one year. But in contrast, the proportion of post natty who make the similar choice has dropped to uh, 39%. And over 42% of the group aged 41 and about will not consider leaving even if they have not received a salary increase for more than three years. Such a huge difference. Well, similarly, we can see from this comparison, nearly 67% of Gen Z said they would consider leaving their job if they had not been promoted within two years. Well, only 51% of post 90 people made the same choice. Well, over 58 people over 41 years old said they would not consider leaving their job even if they had not been promoted for more than three years. So based on this comparison, we can see Gen Z has some more obvious preferences for flash for salary increases and promotion. That is, they hope to get faster recognition and a formation. But here we go, that's the problem. Sometimes we know, especially for the past three and a half years, a lot of things change. It is worth considering that when the overall environment is not that stable anymore, many companies are generally facing huge challenges. They cannot provide corresponding quick salary increases and promotions, and sometimes they have to cut salaries. Then what kind of situation will that be? Okay, in order to understand the phenomenon more, you know, we give this a picture of uh, indexation assignment. Basically the data here shows that overall younger people are relatively more reluctant to go through the crisis with their company. As far as, uh, as far as Gen Z is concerned here, we can see that from the four orange color pillars that this trend will be eased with the rise of the rank. That is the higher the rank of Gen Z, the higher the possibility of sharing view and ball with the companies. This is highly related to people's psychological resilience. So what is psychological resilience? Basically, psychological resilience refers to the speed and intensity of response to adverse events and grief. 
That is the ability of individuals to adapt to the stress and adversity. So I want to show you some results. These results are not only from this Gen Z report, but also from our other research project for the past three and a half years. So all results indicate the similar, you know, uh, the similar path. That is the psychological resilience shows a significant upward trend with the increase of age, with the increase of rent, and also with the increase of experiences. So what that lead to? When we put together the dimension of psychological resilience and sharing joys and uh, sorrows with company together, when the two dimensions put together, in this picture, the lens of the pillar represents the level of psychological resilience. The higher the, uh, the, lo- the longer the pillar, then the higher the psychological resilience. That is to say, once psychological resilience is high, people are more willing to share the joys and sorrows with the company in a crisis. So from the data in the figure, we can see that when company encounter difficulties, even when facing salary cuts, the proportion of people with high psychological resilience who choose not to resign is much higher than those with low psychological resilience. And these differences are even more significant among younger people, including those uh, born in the 1990s and also those born in the 1995s. That is, in Gen Z and people of 26 to 30 years old group, those with higher psychological resilience are significantly more willing to overcome crisis with the company together than those with lower resilience. Therefore, in the face of a crisis, it is crucial to enhance people's psychological resilience. Then the next question is how? Here we go. In terms of enhancing individuals' resilience, well, I published a book called Resilience last year. And in this book, I proposed a model called the Resilience Flywheel. So as you can see, this wheel is turning, is rotating. There are three components of resilience flywheel, including awareness, basically how you view yourself, meaning how you view the world, how you build up your um, uh, the job, the goals, the connections among the goals. And the third you know, uh, pillar or the uh, third blades is connection. That's connections between people because you know, we are all have the social uh, perspective. So three components include awareness, meaning, and connection. Well, the core essence of enhancing psychological resilience lies in integration. So it's not isolated. Integration is the key here. Therefore, making organizational resilience greater than the sum of individual resilience is the value and is the responsibility that top leaders and executives should have. Well, last year in February, I published a research article on organizational resilience at the Harvard Business Review. This paper discussed the topic of how to transmit resilience from individual level to the organizational level. Resilient leadership is a transmission process from understanding and changing ourselves to influencing and motivating others. So corresponding to the three components of individual resilience, basically awareness, meaning, and connection, organizational resilience in talent development also has three components, consensus, collaboration, and empathy. As a result, resilient transmission is the key here. What's related to that? Our research data on this picture shows through resilience transmission, employees are willing to accept changes, challenges, take on additional new projects and their uncertainty. A crucial driving force is actually the trust and the support from the top leaders. Well, not only about the data from this research, we also conducted several different company interviews. We have found out more than once that many unconventional promotions of talents are closely related to this uh, resilience and responsibility shown by their employees in the major crises. Therefore, managers can fully utilize the cohesion in crisis to create and transmit resilience through connections, through trust, and through uh, support, thereby 
improving employees working autonomy. In, uh, working autonomy is very important because it's going to allow them, especially the younger generation, to feel the value and the significance of their work. Okay, it's very interesting to point out in our research, we can see that although the average value of psychological resilience shows an upward trend with age, experience, and job rank, but the differences in psychological resilience between generation significance narrow when people consider their work to be very valuable and meaningful. That is to say, even the younger generation, like Gen Z, when they strongly feel the sense of value and meaning of their work, their psychological resilience level is similar to the older uh, employee. Let me show you this bar. So you can see when the Gen Z feel uh, their sense of values and meaning of work, their psych uh, psychological resilience level is actually very similar to the older generations and is significantly higher than those of Gen Z who think their work has no sense of uh, value and meaning. Correspondingly, when sense of value and meaning of work is very high, the anxiety level, uh, including the anxiety level and the depression behavior tendency of Gen Z will also be significantly reduced. This is the power of resilient leadership transmission. So last year in 2022, last, uh, I think it's October, uh, I published another research article in Harvard, Harvard Business Review summarizing the 10 suggestions for resilient leadership. Well, due to the time limit here, I'm not going to give details about this research, but uh, the overall key point is that in the face of crisis, in the face of uncertainty, leaders should immerse themselves into the situation, be pragmatic, be open-minded, uh, try to accept reality and try to dismantle boundaries. And very importantly, in the face of crisis, we cannot be blindly optimistic. We cannot also be overly pessimistic. So without whitewashing the fact, we should strengthen our employees' belief and transmit resilience. That is a pragmatic and optimistic attitude. So I want to share with the one sentence that, you know, the book I love very much. The book, uh, this book, the title is A Brief History of Tomorrow. Uh, the author of this book, uh, Harali, said, people are usually afraid of change because they feel the, and they fear the unknown. But the single greatest constant for history is that everything changes. So with this changing age, what we've learned from this Generation Z research. Overall, here are some of the key takeaways I want to share with you. Number one, intergenerational differences do exist, but they are not as significant as people imagine. Number two, do not be limited by any label. The higher the level of management, the easier it is for us to fall into cognitive limitations and thinking traps. Number three, Good management is valuable, while bad management is costly. Number four, doing things that one loves and excel at can bring extraordinary motivational effects. And in the meanwhile, giving employees trust and recognition is very, very important. Number five, the career development and the resilience improvement of the new generation represented by Gen Z requires the empowerment and resilience transmission of leaders. And number six, what has changed is to keep up with the time and implement strategies according to the situation. But what remains unchanged is the concept of comprehensive human development, growing together with employees and stakeholders and co uh, continuously empowering each other. So, by ending today's keynote presentation, I want to share with each of you in front of the screen. That is, and no beauty and surprise, constitute the future. Forge ahead with new generation towards greater resilience and goals. Thank you so much. Dr. Zhang, thank you very much. A fascinating piece of work. And uh, I guess one of my takeaways is that some of the assumption we were, assumptions I was making about Gen Z perhaps aren't correct. Whereas uh, there are probably fewer differences as well.
between the different generations and their aspirations and what they want. Fascinating piece of work. And we're going to explore that um, in, in a panel discussion in, in just a short while. Uh, but now I'd like to hand over to Tanuj Kapil Sharmi, who's the Group Head of Human Resources at Standard Chartered Bank, to give us her views on the future of the workplace. Tanuj. Super. Can you hear me? You uh, can. Yes. First, let me apologize for having massive tech issues at my end. Uh, so I was a bit late joining, but I heard everything that Dr. Zhang said, and I agree with you, Michael, absolutely fascinating uh, set of insights. I have to say, Dr. Zhang, I was also relieved to note that some of the points that I had prepared uh, to share with the group today are, um, are completely aligned with yours. So that was a matter of great relief. Um, so look, I, just a couple of points I, I wanted to land. And, uh, you know, it is fascinating doing these sessions after uh, a, a, a great academic as, as, as Dr. Zhang, because the, 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 the view I bring in here is that of a practitioner. Uh, and, um, you know, I represent Standard Chartered Bank. I'm the CHRO. Standard Chartered Bank is an emerging markets bank headquartered in UK. We've been in business for over 160 years, serving um, over 10 million individual and small businesses across Asia, Africa, Middle East, uh, you know, over 20,000 large corporates. We employ um, about 100,000 colleagues uh, at any point in time in some of the fastest and the most exciting um, uh, markets uh, in, in the world. I mean, this topic is of huge interest to me. And you know, China is a critical market for us. Uh, you know, it's, it, it goes to the heart of what we uh, bring uh, for, our, for our clients uh, every day, our, our businesses in China. But also the, the topic of Gen Zs and their impact on business is something that I've been fascinated by. And there's a lot of work that we've been doing in Stanchart, studying this topic, you know, looking at the data from, from Gen Zs that are part of our workforce. You know, we've got about 25% of our global workforce are Gen Zs, and that number is growing very, very fast. So, so it's an area of, uh, of huge uh, personal interest and fascination for me. I'm also here... Um, as uh, in my uh, in the capacity of being a board member of Asia House, so thank you very much once more, Michael, for for, for inviting me. A couple of quick comments I wanted to make. So as leaders, we talk a lot about the complexity of multi generational workforces and the need to understand generational preferences to fully harness the value of diversity. And you know, it's a it's a topic that we think about a lot. For a lot of us who are clearly not Gen Zs, uh, uh, demystifying Gen Zs, who are the latest, uh, which is the latest entrant into the workplace, uh, holds a lot of fascination. For me, I think before you get to understanding Gen Z as employees, it's really important to understand Gen Zs as consumers. And and you know, to me, uh, you know, trying to understand Gen Zs as consumers has given us really interesting insights into understanding their preferences as, as employers. So Gen Zs today represent 25% of the world population. They are estimated to have over USD 7 trillion of purchasing influence. You know, in China, it's 15% of the country's population and are very soon uh, expected to make up the largest portion of the country's workforce. So if you look at them as consumers, there are a couple of things that come out. They are pretty much the first generation of digital natives. You know, I talk a lot about it. It's the first generation where the technology that they have experienced in their personal life is almost always superior to the technology they experience in their work life. That was definitely not uh, my experience when I got into the world of work of, uh, almost 25 years ago, right? So, so the, the idea that it's the first generation of digital natives, high levels of digital literacy, reliance on technology. It's fascinating to see how their social network is informing decisions and shaping their exposure to brands. And this definitely has implications in how they see the employers that they are working for and the experience that they want in the workplace uh, to try and get that experience to be as close to the experience that they have as, as, as consumers. So the first generation of digital natives, they're also the first global generation. So they are growing up in a society where global content and information is more generally available. So, you know, it's, it's the same music, it's the, it's the same uh, view around politics, you know, it's, it's the same idea around 
uh, uh, you know, th th their views on climate sustainability. So this idea of them being a, of the first global uh, a generation is critical. And obviously that has implication, you know, is that going to result in them having nomadic careers? And, you know, is that going to be a big trend is something that we think about. They place a high value on personal fulfillment and self-expression. You know, Dr. Zhang touched on that. They refuse to fit into neat little boxes. So, you know, this idea of bringing their unique identity to work, not being labeled in the way, uh, you know, we've got used to labels is, is a big part of their generation. And they definitely tend to be more societally and environmentally conscious. Uh, so they're more attracted to companies uh, that demonstrate a strong commitment to sustainability, to social responsibility. You know, when we run our grad hiring programs, the focus on sustainability, climate, DNI consistently comes up in what they are evaluating in the companies that they choose to, 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 to work for. So the expectations that Gen Zs have of brands, which is authentic vulnerability, hyper-personalization, genuine activism, as well as challenging identity labels in a lot of ways, I think flows into their experience in the workplace. I mean, the one uh, area which I completely agree with, with Dr. Zhang is Gen Zs, their expectation of what they want in from work is not very different from what all of us want. The, the difference is that they are very vocal in articulating their views and their expectations. So, so they are coming in with a very clearly articulated expectations from, from employment in a way that we perhaps didn't do. So all of the work that we have done and the data that we have looked at in Standard Chartered, a couple of things have come up. You know, they want meaningful work and a strong sense of purpose. So compensation reward levels continue to be incredibly important. But what Gen Zs are looking for is in, are looking for jobs that deliver impact. This idea of does my job deliver impact come across very, very strongly. And they're also looking for a deep sense of belonging. So, you know, we talk a lot about balancing people, planet, uh, profit. And this idea of the balance between people, planet, profit, and what does that mean in, in the careers that Gen Z can have is something that comes across uh, very, very, very strongly. So very clear expectations around diversity, inclusion, transparency, not just in the workplace, but the role that the employer is playing in the broader community and society. So, so to me, this idea of meaningful work and a job that delivers impact is definitely a trend that we are seeing. Career progression and learning opportunities. You know, I think they are looking for not just vertical growth, uh, you know, which is what we are used to, but acquiring new skills. You know, we ran a global learning week in Standard Chartered a couple of weeks ago for four days. We had 68,000 hours of learning that was delivered. And to me, it was fascinating that it was topics of data, digital sustainability, where we saw the most take up in terms of content across generations, but definitely Gen Z. So they are looking for career progression, but it's not just the linear and vertical career progression. They are looking at acquiring new skills. And there is a real, their real focus on, on getting learning opportunities, which to help them acquire new skills. There is a massive theme around flexibility. You know, I, I, we, we believe flexibility is here to stay. They want more independence and right to choose uh, as opposed to having a very regimented view of, of work. This is both around flexible working, but also around the kind of work they want to do in you know, a real take up of agile working we are seeing in some of our younger workforce. So it's flexibility, not in just in terms of where they work and, and when they work, but also why they work and how they work. And I think that's coming across very strongly. Real focus on work-life balance and well-being. And again, some interesting research, uh, you know, I read from Deloitte, which shows that at least half of Gen Zs feel stressed and anxious at work all or most of the time, including due to long term and short term financial sort of worry. So, so I think those the focus on well-being and what does that mean is is uh, really interesting. So I, I think, you know, for me, the summary is, again, not very dissimilar. You know, it, it is important to understand Gen Zs as consumers even before you start thinking about them as employees. They are growing up in a world where they want hyper-personalization and authenticity, and they're choosing brands that are able to deliver uh, uh, that, that concept of vulnerability in the products they buy 
and that translates into their experience of uh, what they are looking for in in employers. So, so those were some of the observations I wanted to share, Michael, and then I'll pass on to you for the panel discussion. Anuj, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating stuff, and as you say, a real world practitioner of of. Uh, of, of handling Gen Z and their different needs, different aspirations and the like. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tanuj Kapilashrami from Standard Chartered and also, as she kindly mentioned, on the board of Asia House. I want to turn now to our panel discussion and we will be asking you, the audience, to take part in this discussion. If you have a question, please let us know and we'll get into that a bit later. But I'd like to welcome Carolyn Raggett, Managing Director, Board and Ag Food Tech at Russell Reynolds Associates. Carolyn joins us from London. She's only recently moved back to London after some 12 years in Hong Kong. Pooja Javeri, who's Leadership Development and APAC Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Director at LSEG. She's joining us now from Singapore. And Sean Lee, General Manager, Robert Walters, China. He's on the line from Beijing. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, Sean, I might start with you. The context is interesting at the moment because youth unemployment, the Gen Z unemployment rate in China is huge. It's something like 28, 20.8% for urban youth unemployment. So not only are there different needs and aspirations, but trying to get a job as a Gen Z person in China with uh, 10 or 11 million more grads coming on stream very shortly must pose its own challenges. Um, indeed, indeed. Um, half of my um, employees in China are the uh, lead talents, actually, and um, I, I interview quite a few number of um, graduates. And I, I, I would say, to be honest, it's currently a, a, a tough market, uh, you know, for employment for the younger generation uh, now, uh, especially after the pan pandemic. Um, several reasons, I would say. Firstly, um, you know, as you said, the number of college students have been increasing year on year. Uh, in 2023, this year, there are more than um, 11 million college graduates in China who are looking for jobs, um, while the economic growth is, you know, slowing down with less job vacancies, especially in um, internet and real estate, which used to employ quite a lot of um, graduates. Um, and secondly, I would say there is um, there is an imbalance between what the graduates are expecting and what the market demands. Um, there is a great shortage, actually, of labor in sectors like manufacturing and service industries, uh, while many young ones favor office jobs over physical work, um, you know, in China. Mm. Um, and, and another challenge I would say is, um, is, the, is the gap between what's taught in college and what's needed actually in a workplace in terms of knowledge, in terms of skill sets. So I definitely would suggest Gen Z talents gaining internship um, experience to increase their competitiveness in the job market. Um, and finally, I have to say that uh, you know Gen, Gen Z talents have high expectations of you know employment, um, while you know they will find it difficult to find a role that is a perfect match. Um, so, so indeed, there are quite a few graduates who are less proactive in finding employment because of this. Yeah. Uh, Pooja, can I come to you now? And on that same theme, is there a, a gap between the aspirations of Gen Z and what's available in the market? And how are they reconciling that, that difference? <laughs> um, oh, sorry, Sean, I'll bring that one to Pooja. I'll come back to you in a moment. Pooja. Sure, sure. I'm happy to let Sean go first if you'd like, Sean. No, no, you, you go, me. please. Sure. Um, so I was going to say that I think um, there's a couple of different bits, right? Increasingly, it's not a China-specific um, trend that we're seeing. We're seeing this globally, right? We want to see more empowerment. Um, the generation is asking to have more say, be more entrepreneurial, bring their ideas to life and have a voice impacting not only the organizational strategy and products, but also how we go to market with them, mm. right? So um, I think it's more a mentality shift. It is that idea of, you know, our consumers are increasingly technologically savvy and not all the decision makers have that same kind of upbringing and had that same kind of opportunity, right? So what we are finding is that we want to give people that opportunity to have a voice 
ultimately they are the consumers that we are going to mm. be um, servicing in the future any which way. But how we do that becomes really critical because it's a matter of kind of, you know, the cultural dynamic that needs to be really, really crisp around you have a say, you have um, experience, you have um, an opinion, we want to hear it. And then this is the way in a highly regulated business that we bring that to life as well. So, I mean, one of the findings of the report is that good management is good and bad management isn't. Carolyn, I'll, I'll come to you now. You, you you actively recruit at board level, CEO level. Is that one of the, the, the benchmarks that you look at when you're looking at candidates for key roles, their understanding of Gen Z, their, their, their uh, ability to adapt their recruitment strategies or the, you know, the recognition that it is a different generation with different values, different needs, different aspirations? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I have to say, I was really struck by the research of Dr. Tan, really resonated what, with what we observe anecdotally. Um, and a lot of our clients do ask us about how do we compete for Gen Z talent in China? Um, and those, those clients fall into sort of private owned enterprise um, and obviously multinationals, and they, they both have very different approaches. Um, I would say there's, this is a very live topic for our, our clients and some of the observations um, and questions we were asked is, you know, with, with so many graduates either on the market or in work, but always looking to move, two years is a massively long time horizon for these people. Yeah. Um, how do we sift the really high potential, high caliber candidates at such high volume from, from the others? Um, and I think that that's a really difficult question to answer mm. when so much promotion within companies happens either in a linear rather than a vertical mm. way. It happens very quickly, often based on potential, not on track record. So evaluating and understanding this generation is, is a massive topic for our clients. Sean, can I take that uh, to you now? That that the, the impatience, for want of a better term, of Gen Z, uh, according to the research, they want salary increases of 10 to 20%. They want promotions within, you know, three months or something of joining. They want rapid rise. They want purpose. They want trust. They want responsibility. Uh, you know, fantastic aspirations. But how does that square with reality in the market? And as an employer, how does one deal with that? Well, uh, before I ask, um, answer this question, I would say um, it, it makes sense for us to um, um, get a little bit more knowledge about the environment in which the Gen Z population has grown up, um, you know, most of them are the only child in their families and they get what they want easily. They get all the attention. They're at the absolute center of a family. You know, all the attention is there, is on them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're in the internet generation. So they have access to a large variety of information about the outside world. They, and in this sense, it's fair to say that they're more flexible, creative, and they're more curious and open for new ideas. So that's why, you know, you, you, you have this feeling that, uh, you know, they have, they, they hope to get a lot of things quickly. Um, you know, because simply when they, in, in the process, when they were uh, brought up, they get things easily and quickly because, um, you know, they're the only child. Um, and, and well, I think definitely the gap is huge here and, um, you know, they will, they will need to, um, um, uh, understand what the real market is like. Um, but at the same time, companies, recruiters, um, you know, management are also working on adapting themselves to the future, uh, generation in, you know, for example, how, uh, how they position themselves, how they, uh, you know, do the company branding in, 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 in the job market um, and how, how they create a, a workplace that, uh, you know, gives Gen Z more opportunities uh, to fit their needs because, you know, inevitably the world will be theirs. Um, and mm -hmm. if we don't make necessary changes to, uh, you know, adapt to or to give them the opportunities to, to realize what they want, well, it doesn't mean that we encourage that, you know, you, you, you make a job change every two years, um, but, you know, definitely um, uh, an interesting finding, um, which I, I, I like uh, and I agree with in the, in the research is that, you know, short term goals of them within three years do not really closely align with the mid term goals within yeah. five to 10 years, uh, which is unlike other generations. 
Uh, and they see the first few years more an experience for them to to explore themselves and to learn and you know to to uh, to really then decide what's next uh, for the mid or long term in their career or they you know just maybe they would continue their studies and um, pursue another subject with um, you know um, a major in the future. So um, I, I would say that there is not like a, a definite answer, immediate answer, you know, to that question of, you know, how we close the gap or, yeah. you know, how we, uh, you know, make the changes necessary to, uh, to suit the, the needs. Um, but, you know, it, the, the thing itself that we are talking about this, we are recognizing all these differences, mm. um, you know, creates opportunities for us to uh, uh, adapt, change and be more flexible. Fuji, if I may come to you now, one of the things that struck me about the report was the measures on resilience and the importance of well-being, you know, physical and mental well-being. And clearly, you know, mental health generally now is getting much more airtime, much more, you know, very valuable and very important discussion. But there were quite, in, in some respects, alarming differences between the resilience of Gen Z, their concern about depression and the like, versus the older generations. Is that something, again, employers need to be aware of? Is that a generational thing? Uh, is that something that employers have to adapt to and be aware of and, and clearly be very sensitive to? Yeah, I mean, honestly, coming back into the workforce after the COVID lockdowns globally, um, I think this is a common theme globally across generations, right? The emphasis we've placed, um, I personally find reassuring that, you know, we are going to be a whole lot more considerate. Our, everybody's demanding it, right? Whether that translates to working from home or hybrid models where, you know, you're half time in the office, half time working elsewhere. Um, I think it has repositioned where how much time an individual puts an emphasis an individual puts in the work life versus the personal life. This whole concept of balancing almost to some degree has now been replaced with an integration of work and life, right? With that, however, comes that really important part around, am I doing enough to look after myself? How am I showing up to look after my teams, right? This whole idea about 996, right? That's not what Gen Z wants. Gen Z very much wants to have that flexibility. They want to have that, um, that same in terms of, you know, this is important to me. This is a generation that hasn't started to have families, doesn't necessarily want to have families, but we can't generalize for every single person, right? They came, as um, Sean pointed out earlier, they were the only children, right? They, for most, for most of them, given, you know, um, previous legislation. However, now the question becomes, What's the flip side, right? How do we help them balance and show them the possibilities? Generations before you have somehow managed to balance. We didn't have the same technology that allowed us to go on vacation but still check in. The question being, though, is do they want it, yes. right? And how much flexibility can they have and how much can they try um, to balance these things for themselves and really integrate it, right? So I think there's a huge um, opportunity for us. There's a huge opportunity to help listen and co-create the future of work generally. And this is that big population that is coming in and we have to make accommodations on both sides as well. Carolyn, that has to come from the top, doesn't it? The, the culture of an organisation to enable that sort of flexibility, that sort of integrated work life as opposed to work life, not life balance. Uh, are you seeing that? Is there a recognition of that at board level that businesses need to change the way they operate? That they, yeah, we, not just the way they recruit, but the way they work. Absolutely, absolutely, Michael. It's a, it's a hot topic in boardrooms. Yeah. Um, not because it's a, a fluffy topic, because it has economic value. When right? you think about retention, productivity, cost of churn. Um, future development uh, or development of future leaders comes from that graduate moment onwards. I think what organizations are also recognizing specifically within China is, is a couple of dimensions is this is a, as the research points out, as we've all alluded to, this is a generation that is hungry to acquire a breadth of experience. They are not seeing their lives in a corporate linear 30 year progression hmm. in one organization. In fact, that's positively um, unappealing <laughs> uh, to this, to this hmm. group. So the question for corporates becomes, how do we create a culture that's community, uh, to use um, Tanuja's word, belonging? Hmm. Um, and it may be, you know, sort of armchair psychology. It may, may be creating communities as an extension of being an only child. 
So if I bring a concrete example, I recognize you on the record, so I won't name the organization, but well-known American apparel company in China has built um, an amazing campus, uh, which is as much about being there to have a lifestyle of working with a community of colleagues that makes it more creative and more co-productive than it is nine to five jacket on the back of the chair. And to illustrate it, it would not be uncommon three or four times a week for the president of Greater China, and this is a multi-billion business in China, to come to the gym in the morning and be there with all her co-workers. So the idea of flatter hierarchy, access to senior people, the sort of even just the permission to speak up and be heard mm. is really important. And that particular organization post-COVID has a 97% attendance at least four days a week in person. Interesting, interesting. Uh, right, I want to turn it over to the audience now to ask questions. And if you'd like to ask a question, let, let the team know via the Q&A box because I would like to elevate you to to um, the, the program so you can ask your own question. I'm first going to go to Katie Lee of HSBC. Hi, Katie. Hi, hi, and thanks so much. It's been absolutely fascinating um, discussion and, and learned an awful lot. Something, though, that sort of kept running through my head in China is that um, – I don't know if you maybe I'm sort of not not grasp it, but we're we're very conscious that the state-owned sector, the state-owned enterprises, are the main employers in China. And what I'm hearing is is a lot of flexibility and flatter structures and so on. But the thing that has always struck me uh, when I look at China is how hierarchical those organisations are, and how, in, for a Westerner, how rigid the sort of career path can can be. Is there now? Is Gen Z having any impact on, on the, the state sector or is this going to be a bigger and bigger divide between private uh, companies, be they international or, or Chinese owned, and the state sector? Great question, Katie. Sean, can we start with you on that one? Sorry, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, that, that's really a great question. Um, uh, well, for state-owned companies, um, I, I don't imagine that to be changing rapidly in terms of uh, how the structure is set up. Um, so, not surprisingly, um, there is a, a less favorable choice of uh, working for state-owned enterprises, uh, you know, for the Gen Z. They would be much, much more willing to work for uh, private uh, companies um, and foreign and multinational companies in China uh, because of the flexibility offered and because of, um, you know, they, they, they don't really see stability as the utmost um, important factor in, in what they choose, uh, you know, in their uh, career. Um, so um, whether these companies are changing or uh, adapting to, um, you know, a, a more sort of flat organization, um, it, it's really hard to say. But um, at least uh, the private sectors, I would say they are more evolving towards that. Um, but I, I see very, very little change uh, in the uh, state-owned enterprises. Buja, same question or similar question to you. Are we more likely to see change in... Uh, private sector companies than state-owned enterprises or indeed, frankly, civil services in, 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 in government in, uh, uh, in, in governments around the region? Yeah, I mean, when I think about governments around the region, right, um, I think they are very much, they have designed fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. But I think where we, where we do see a lot of change and a lot of reaction a whole lot more rapidly is very much in the private sectors, right? However, like I can, you know, for, from a Singapore perspective, they're competing with similar talent. They want the, mm -hmm. the creme de la creme uh, as per se, right? And so what that means is oftentimes, what is what are these big companies doing and how can we learn from them without necessarily taking what they're doing? They, they will let it steep, they'll let it test it out a little bit. I'll say from our perspective, I mean, we are very much looking at, you know, how do you accelerate? The question you asked Sean earlier as well around, um, you know, graduate programs, for example, yes. right? They're expecting, you know, every three months an increment, every three months of a better title. Well, we don't necessarily offer that, that 
one of the things that we have seen in other organizations, global organizations, is in certain countries like a China, like in India, it is very much um, a milestone that's laid out. Every quarter, you're going to have a review. Every six months, you may see a percentage increase. You may see a, a little bit of a title bump as well, but it's very transparent, right? So Katie, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question directly, but there's something around setting those expectations up front um, and managing those expectations. Whereas in, in the state-owned enterprises, I'm not sure that, that that necessarily happens, at least as of now. If I was to bet on it, I, I would, and I'm not a betting person, just to be very clear, um, but I would anticipate, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, that may look different. They may take some of these best practices mm. and embed it within their, within their organizations as well. But Carolyn, Carolyn, I'll come to you. It's really interesting what Pooja just said about organizations in the private sector now having quarterly reviews, quarterly bumps in salaries. Hey, that sounds like you know a huge amount of bureaucracy, but it sounds like mm -hmm. a lot of structure for, for a workforce that wants flexibility. Are you seeing that in the businesses you're dealing with? Um, seeing it, uh, seeing it, yes, but probably not as a widespread mm -hmm. practice and certainly different practices between different types of organizations. Um, it is it is very challenging for a global multinational to have quarterly bumps and reviews yeah. only in China and not create an egalitarian, inclusive um, program for, for all Gen Z across the world. So I think there are some natural internal barriers for some of our clients, but certainly for the private and, and enterprise. Uh, they're so agile, they move so fast, they are moving people around on the basis of potential, not necessarily on track record, that they can and often have the financial firepower and autonomy to, to make these sorts of decisions. They're built in different governance models, yes. um, different REM and people models, so they have more flexibility to respond to this generation. Okay, next question now from Adrian Jones from Hayes. Adrian. You're on mute, I think, Adrian. You're still on mute. Thanks, uh, oh, thanks, yeah. Michael, and thanks for uh, Michael and, uh, and and Asia House and all the panelists today. It's been a very interesting and revealing uh, uh, talk. Um, I, I, um, I run our Hayes Global Link Asia business, supporting uh, Asia businesses with finding overseas talent for our clients there um, in China and around the region. Um, and increasingly, I, I speak to, to job seekers every day. Um, increasingly, they are interested in, they're more and more interested in um, the ethics of the company. And I think um, more so, um, we're seeing that they're more interested and more aware of uh, mental health issues and well-being issues um, and I'd like to ask the panel um, how they think that employers are looking at this, particularly with with reference to sort of 996. And I even heard the expression the other day, um, 007. I'm not sure if that is a well-known phrase or just that person used it. But um, how are employers um, dealing with mental health issues um, with these work po policies, which are quite common in China? Okay. Uh, Carolyn, let's start with you. Mental health issues. We did come out of the research as well on the sort of general well-being piece. How are employers looking at that? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I'm sure Sean's going to have more detail on that than, than I will. But briefly, um, it was mentioned earlier, Adrian, in the, in the discussion, uh, we see employers giving more autonomy to employees to steer their own work-life balance and make decisions so, for example, are you going to, as Pooja mentioned, are you going to check in on vacation on emails? Are you going to come into the campus in person? You know, how do you how do you manage that? And if you if you look at the China website of the American Apparel Company I mentioned earlier, you'll see that they lay out their benefits. It's 50-50 well-being and community and compensation. They balance them absolutely equally. I think probably I'm more qualified to talk about the ethics mm. piece um, because boards um, outside of China, which have significant operations in China, in many jurisdictions are coming under a lot of pressure from pension funds, investors, et cetera, to be extremely transparent, particularly um, in regards to their reporting and obviously um, you know, culture, operational behavior and so on comes, comes into that. Um, and I think that 
China represents a huge opportunity for organizations to get that right and to add premium to their share price um, and attract investors to their organizations. But I think it's very much a work in progress um, on the on the ethics when I look at it from a governance perspective. Pooja, both to you now. The ethics question is interesting because uh, I've seen it in a sort of Gen Z. They, they sort of have their values and they want to stick to them. The ethics is very important to them. And equally, there's pressure on big organizations from shareholders, from big institutional shareholders to develop that. So I guess that you know, it's coming from both sides and hopefully driving change. So what are you seeing in the ethics space and also in, in, in that mental health space? Um, if it's okay with you, I'll answer the mental health space first, right? Sure. Um, we, when we think about um, the key findings, right? We know that uh, mental health is vital for the Gen Zs. We know that um, resilience plays a big part as well. Um, and what I would say is that the sense of belonging that Tanuj also referred to earlier, right? When you take those three, three different elements and put them together, um, one of the things that we see is obviously you have the EAPs, the employee assistance programs, making sure that you have the benefits coverage, uh, making sure that you have the opportunity to get counseling, to have a therapist where you need it and having access to all of that. But it's also around what kind of conversations are you having in-house, right? So for example, and perhaps not quite pertinent to, to Gen Z specifically, but parenting, right? Um, that's hard no matter where you are in the world, no matter how many kids you have, you have different challenges. What kind of community can you bring together? If you're going through, um, you know, other, other challenges at home on the domestic front, financial well-being, right? Things like that. Um, how much are you as an organization helping your people really understand and really appreciate what that conversation is and building that sense of community across the board, right? Again, because they don't necessarily have um, a sibling to look, um, look to or um, a very large or uh, personal kind of networks necessarily, we have to help them build those networks. Coming back to your question around ethics, Michael, um, I think that values piece is so critical, right? But is that specific just to um, just to Gen Z? I'm not so convinced. I mean, if you think about all of us and, you know, which organizations we've chosen to go to, which organizations we've stuck at, it really is. The values are on a website. They're written on a board somewhere. But how do you live and read those on a day to day basis? How do people show up um, as behaviors as well? So I think, um, Adrian, to your question, right, how do you not just talk about the values, but what are those case studies that are going to resonate for Gen Z that really shows them coming to life, right? Um, and I think that's where the narrative really needs to lie at this point. Sure. Same question to you, please. Sure. Okay. So mental health, um, I would say, interestingly, um, on the on the one hand, we, uh, we give people work-life balance um, in flexible working hours or, you know, work, work from home arrangements. But what I see from the Gen Zs is that they need human to human connections. Um, so it, it's it's a little bit contrary here that, um, you know, um, what, what we find, especially during the lockdown in Shanghai, uh, we do have some people who, you know, who really like human to human connections, but, you know, could not get that in a few months. Um, and, you know, if we, if we look at their health um, condition mentally, they're impacted. Um, so I, I think for organizations, um, you know, uh, put, put it, uh, you know, just mentioned about, you know, the uh, assistance provided by the company. And, you know, we do have a lot of people cancelling, um, you know, when needed. So that that's good. But at the same time, I think, you know, it's essential for us to create more opportunities for, you know, the Gen Zs uh, to, to really have face time with, with colleagues, co-workers, um, you know, like what Callan said, you know, uh, you know, going to the gym with your co-workers and have just more communication and open dialogues. Um, I, I think this would definitely help regarding uh the 007 thing i would say um it, it's more to be honest it's more commonly seen in the internet world um and not not necessarily every internet company is like that um and obviously this has been a very um open um, you know in public that people are talking about it and people do not think that's the that's the way it should be. So there has been um, a lot of emphasis from you know the HR community I know um, you know who work for internet companies that you know they they they, they avoid it and they do not encourage it. Um, they uh, do think about it, but at the same time um, you know I also hear from 
from the um, uh, the, the Gen Z uh, uh, workers who are saying that they they just need to work their butts off to um, um, you know to to keep competitive in the market because uh, you know as um, as there are so many. Uh, people in, in, in the market trying to compete with them, um, they, they just have to, uh, you know, be working extremely hard, um, you know, to keep um, ahead in the game. Uh, and you know what? Um, if I look at the salaries we give to um, to graduates in uh, 2010, uh, in, comparison, in comparison to the salaries we offer to graduates of the same caliber, nothing changed much. Mm. Uh, there has not been actually an equal increase in comparison to the CPI uh, index or, you know, the um, uh, inflation rate. So uh, th this is largely because of the huge and increasing demand in the market. And you could imagine that it would be very competitive, uh, although companies are not encouraging uh, 996 or um, 007 anymore. Uh, in reality, there are quite a few people working like that. Sadly. Good. Okay, a couple more questions. Time for a couple more. Let's go to Sandy Jin now. Sandy? Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. All right. Uh, so, oh, uh, yeah. Thanks for everyone for your intervention. Fascinating um, discussions. So, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of VLAN.Live. We are a metaverse um, um, company that um, provide a virtual online experience solutions to uh, com uh, to to clients like L'Oreal and Disney. Uh, so, mostly HR related events. So, um, you know, um, so our observation and practices show like you know Gen Z are very interested uh, in new technologies like metaverse, like AI. And they show a very high level of, um, you know, participation and engagement. So, uh, so I guess like my question to all of you is, how do you see the effect of this new wave of technology, right? Uh, AI, uh, metaverse, uh, and a lot of new frontier tech, and how do they impact, you know, employers' interaction with their candidates, with their employees, and how might that change, you know, uh, employers' branding and and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. So great question. So you, you, you're asking how technology will affect the recruitment, the relationship between employers and, and graduates and the Gen Z um, uh, candidates that come through the desk. Is that right? Yeah. And also day-to-day -day corporate culture. Okay. Yeah. Puju, if I can start with you on that one. Sure, I'll give it a stab. Um, fortunately, not a recruitment specialist. However, um, what I will share is that we're very much very cognizant around the fact that you need to embed it, you need to make it relevant, right? So when, I, when we think about learning overall, right, this whole idea of short form videos, very, very relevant, right? How do we take like the TikToks of the world? How do we take, um, you know, all the different uh, means that we have and embed it as part of our organizational culture and truly create that culture of learning, right? When we think about employer branding, especially, you know, there is no point necessarily in doing, um, like physical assets, right? Rather, we go after the digital assets, right? Making sure that our brand is relevant, making sure that we're speaking the same language and consistently doing so across the globe, but then also making sure that we're being nuanced around what's top of mind in those, in those locations that we're going after as well, right? Um, when it comes to the recruitment um, process, of course, we use AI, we use, you know, Textio, for example, when we're writing job descriptions, making sure that it is very inclusive. Um, and we, we take pride in that, right? We're investing in these capabilities and these new age technologies, um, because this is what we know is going to help make it relevant to this audience that we're going after. Sure. And the same question to you, the use of technology in recruitment has been, you know, way for a while. It's often a a lot of CVs will come in and technology will go through it before a person ever sees them. But how do you see that developing over time? And how does Gen Z have to adapt how they apply for jobs, how they interact with employers uh, as a result? Um, apart from the normal job boards, um, you know, we generally use, um, I would say uh, Gen Z talents, they um visit a lot of social media sites um you know to really find people that they uh that share the same values or share the same interests and um you know examples are like uh Xiao Hong Shu uh, or Douyin um or so uh, uh, WeChat groups um in, you know so the, so that's why nowadays a lot of recruiters they're running uh digital tools uh you know to um to engage with uh, the targeted uh candidates 
Uh, in regards to the interviewing process, it's not a new technology now, um, you know, for AI to uh, conduct screening and interviewing pro uh, processes, especially for campus recruiting projects. Um, I would say I, 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 you know, a suggestion for recruiters is that, you know, don't overuse technology. Um, I mean, don't hold the assumption that, you know, uh, the, the more technologies we adapt to, we adopt uh, in, in the process, uh, the, the more talents, uh, you know, Gen Z talents we can uh, attract. Um, because in the end, you know, they're humans and, uh, you know, the eye-to-eye -eye contact thing and the face-to-face -face interaction will still be critical. Uh, you know, for the engagement with uh, the targeted talents. Um, and regarding uh, AI metaverse, you know, um, I would say for, because there has been a huge um, uh, uh, increase in the subject matters uh, in computer sciences, uh, you know, at various colleges in China. Uh, so definitely, um, you know, uh, those people would, uh, you know, be more interested in the in, in what's the the edgy uh, technology out there, and uh, you know they will be uh, far more interested, uh, you know, in uh, engaging with uh, such companies uh, for their career choices. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think um, it, it couldn't represent the whole population here, yeah. but you know, for for students in the computer sciences sector, definitely yes. Okay, final. Point to you, Carolyn, the use of technology in terms of recruitment. Will it increase? Will it change the, the way employers interact with Gen Z and, and you know, the wider uh, yeah. employment group? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this isn't a generation we're, we're directly involved with, but I would say that the technology is here to stay. It will evolve. You know, this is a ginormous population. Yeah. And so that the use of technology and sifting through that what I am hearing, interestingly, is that it's not just about processing a volume of potential candidates at that Gen Z level. Organisations are now bringing in much more nuanced filters around mm. um, mindset, uh, focus on purpose, uh, diversity, inclusion, fairness for, for people applying from the major cities, but also third, fourth plus cities, rural backgrounds. And interestingly, now also filtering for motivation and commitment to stay more than two to three years with an organization. So getting very smart in those filtering um, aspects of the technology. Tremendous. Look, I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you to our panelists, Sean Lee, Carolyn Raggett, and Pooja Javeri. Thank you to Tanoosh who spoke earlier. And my great thanks to CKGSB for bringing us this report, allowing us to launch it here at Asia House. A really interesting piece of work, full of insights. And I sort of recommend everyone have a look at it. As I said, I went through it a couple of times and it's just uh, very rich in data and interesting um, material. Uh, so look, thank you all very much for joining us. We've had a couple of hundred people on the line for the most part, been a fantastic discussion. Um, we will make available this recording. We'll make available the report itself and probably if I can convince them, the slide pack as well. So there'll be plenty of follow-up for all of you. Uh, lots to digest. Thanks all very much for being with us. Do take care, and we'll talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now.